My name is George Marie. I'm the program manager for writing at Centrum and I run the Port Townsend Writers Conference each July. The Port Townsend Writers Conference and the Northwind Reading Series have had a long-standing collaboration and we are grateful to once again join with our friends in a partnership to host tonight's event. Before we get started, we would like to acknowledge that we are broadcasting from lands and waters of the Coast Salish people, and we honor their thriving culture and their efforts to sustain their homelands. And now I'd like to turn the mic over to the organizers of tonight's event, Holly Hughes and Linda Robertson. Thank you. Thank you, George, for your introduction, and thank you for the land acknowledgement, especially as part of the new Northwind Art in Port Townsend, we're so pleased to be partnering with Centrum in our mission to bring poetry to our Port Townsend community. And thanks to Centrum's extended writing community and Zoom, we have a wide audience tonight and we're really happy to see you all. As George mentioned, I'm one of three co-curators of the Northwind Reading Series and I'm pleased to be hosting tonight with Linda Robertson. And I also want to give a call out to Sheila Bender for helping get the word out. We're glad to have such a good turnout. This is our first Northwind reading of 2021. And we're thrilled tonight to be hosting two Washington State Poet Laureates, Kathleen Flanagan, who served as Poet Laureate from 2012 to 2014, and Claudia Castro Luna, our current Poet Laureate, who's served since 2018. I know them both and I know they both took to heart the mission to bring poetry to all corners of Washington State and put a lot of mileage on their vehicles in the process. And I'm hoping that there might be time at the end to talk a little bit about their experiences as Poet Laureate. It is my great honor to introduce my friend and poetry sister Kathleen Flanagan we are both um, alumna of the Rainier Writing Workshop MFA program, and it was such a treat to meet Kathleen and to um, be able to continue in a poetry community with her. Kathleen Flanagan's most recent poetry collection is Post Romantic, released in October 2020 by University of Washington Press. Her other books are famous from University of Nebraska Press, named a notable book by the American Library Association, and Plume from University of Washington Press in 2012, which was a finalist for the William Carlos Williams Award. Her awards include fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and Artist Trust, a Pushcart Prize, the Prairie Schooner Book Prize for Poetry, and a Washington State Book Award. And as I mentioned earlier, she served as Washington State Poet Laureate from 2012 to 2014. So please welcome Kathleen Flanagan. Thank you, Holly. It's, it's lovely to be at North Wind and Centrum all at once. And I so appreciate, Bill did such a great job with the series for so many years. I'm just very happy that you, you've all continued it on and I'm, Delighted to be reading with, with Claudia tonight. It's such a treat. Um, I am going to start. I've been, I'm in a terrific uh, poetry book club. And this month we're reading Lucille Clifton. And I wanted to start with a short poem by Lucille Clifton. This one is called, I Once Knew a Man. I once knew a man who had wild horses killed. When he told about it, the words came galloping out of his mouth and shook themselves and headed off in every damn direction. His tongue was wild and wide and spinning when he talked, and the people he looked at closed their eyes and tore the skins off their backs as they walked away and stopped eating meat. There was no holding him once he got started. He had had wild horses killed one time and they rode him to his grave. Kind of a dangerous move to start like that, <laughs> but I will, I will move forward. Um, I, I was given a prompt recently, uh, uh, the title, We Are All God's Poems. And I sat with that for a very long, for several weeks and then I went to the, the post office one afternoon and I came home and wrote a poem very quickly. This is, so this is called, We Are All God's Poems. 
Because I had agreed to hold the man's place in line while he left to fetch his cane, he paid me back in his booming voice with his memoirs. The line went out the door of the post office, Valentine's Rush, and he covered a lot of ground while we waited six feet apart, less, but what could I do? including his seven college majors and the failure of Darwin to describe a world that God created in six days. His friend, the Nobel Prize, who won, his friend with the Nobel Prize agreed, followed by his martial arts class with Bruce Lee, who was so fast, he'd exchanged the quarter in each of his palms for two dimes and a nickel, and you couldn't even see his arms move. That's pretty fast, I said. His mask was a complicated whole head affair that made him look like a welder or a guy stuck inside a mailbox. He explained he'd had a brain stroke and ever since, if he fell down, he couldn't get up. The stroke hadn't dampened his voice. He'd been head lifeguard at the U of W, and when he was 59, he could still walk five miles in one hour and two minutes before he boxed a few rounds, then warmed down with a mile swim. The pretty seeming woman ahead of me, holding a comically tall stack of parcels, turned around once to meet my eyes. I offered when he asked that I hailed from Eastern Washington. He'd had a great grandfather from there he met just twice, when he was three and the man was 103, and when he was seven and the man was 107. He lived to be 112, but his brothers lived to 114, 116, 118, and 120. Everybody else in line stayed quiet, and I believed I was their representative ready to receive whatever the man had to share. Then it was my turn at the counter, but for a few minutes longer, there we were in our masks and orderly distances, in the shadow of Bruce Lee's dangerous hands, every one of us on the honor system, the most honorable system of all the systems. Okay, I'm gonna read three poems from my book, Post Romantic which came out in uh, the fall. And it's, it's, it's kind of a fun book to, to read from because it, it has a lot of different threads so I can follow a number of different paths. But uh, there's a lot of poems about marriage and family. There's a number of poems about America and my sort of complicated love affair with America. Um, but what I thought I would do tonight is read three poems that are set in childhood. Um, and this first one, is one of my very earliest memories um, of waking up from a nap in my crib. And for some reason, I, I, did, I had a residency at the Bloedel um, Reserve, which is an absolutely beautiful place. And there's something about being immersed in this beauty and all the green that made me think very far back. I, was, I didn't write very much, but what I, this was one of the things I did write there. It's called All Unknowns Are Equal. All unknowns were equal, were equal when my head was still soft like a mushroom and I'd wake in the banded light to a consciousness like moss. How large that yellow green world with its shadow prints on the window, but also the marshland that was I. Some scale measured the two equal. And since I could wander only a few steps in either direction, I wasn't afraid. This seems now like the vestigial memory of some other ancestral being, though I still feel the blue satin quilt pulled to my chin and watch myself unfolding fingers from a hand at the far reach of my arm with a patience I'll never recover or comprehend the patience of a low place in the land waiting to become a sea or maybe an inlet since the self is rinsed each day in the world. Mother used to say, I'd lie quietly in my crib a long while. This next poem is 
about my middle son, about his very early childhood. Um, one of my very fondest memories of mothering was actually a, this experience of um, reading a book of very flowery about King Arthur um, to the boys when they were little. And um, so I, I had this poem and I worked on it over a number of years. It, and it finally it was the poem that told me that the really essential ingredient here was that Arthur was a little brother and so was my son. He was the little brother. And so that, that was the key that was missing to this whole thing. So I wrote this in a form that is kind of interesting to me. It's just a sentence. It's one sentence, and um, which I recommend. It's a, it's a fun form to try. This is called Reading Aloud. When young Arthur, on a mission for his older brother, assayed the sword in the stone, then advanced through a heavy hail of wherefores and withals to mount the anvil and grip the hilt, unheralded and alone. My second son, dismounted from his spaceship bed, approached the center of their messy room and in his red plaid pajamas reached forth into the seamless air and pulled. Okay, so this last poem is a long one. It's, a, it's in actually in eight parts. And I wanted to read it tonight in part because um, Holly was an early reader of this poem and she had some really important insights that sort of helped me understand how to finish it off. So this is in part for Holly. Um, I also wanted to read it because I'm reading with Claudia tonight and she has this beautiful long poem about the Columbia River and the Columbia is the, the, the main character in this poem as well. And um, the, the Columbia is very important to me. I grew up on it, but even more than that, our family, our entire family lived down the Columbia in Hood River and in Portland. And so we made that trip once or twice a month for my entire, entire uh, childhood and into adulthood and so that that drive from the from the scrub and the sagebrush into the green along that incredibly dramatic scenery that is just like etched into me like nothing else um so that that's kind of one important thing to know about this it's, this is a poem about a memory of one of those trips the other thing i want to say is this is a poem that that really um fights against the desire for nostalgia. You know, it, it wants nostalgia and it doubts nostalgia. And, and this, the other thing is that one of the things I've been dealing with through this entire last presidency was the fact that I, I was born into one America that is gone now. And so I feel like I was equipped with a certain uh, set of skills for being an American citizen that no longer apply. So I think one of the things that hard for me about where we are now is that I don't feel equipped. And, and so that's going on in the poem too. Okay. It's called Letter to Rilke. If you, if I'm, you hear me talking to you, the you is Rilke because I was reading the Duino elegies over and over again. So he's the you. Letter to Rilke, November, 2016. I'm remembering a Western scene. I was a child, sticky hot between my brothers in the backseat of a Buick doing 80 down a two lane highway. The desert gaped like the shed shell of some giant writhing thing. The truth was just as alien. Basalt plateaus and canyons carved 15,000 years ago by cataclysmic floods. But the floods were still an arcane discredited theory and because we didn't know, we couldn't see. We skittered across the massive landscape, completely ignorant, inhaling my father's cigar smoke. Viewed from that line of pelicans flying, our car crawled like an ant in a trail of ants following the river. Through the riv though the river was so systematically dammed, it was by then a series of still lakes. From my place in the back seat, I watched my mother in sunglasses glance at my father, glance at my brothers and me, then back to the highway with a look I took for granted then, but don't now that I'm older. 
You wrote that angels and animals are complete, but we humans are made of lack and what we're striving for was once nearer and truer and attached to us with infinite tenderness. That's Rilke's words. And so I'm drawn again to that moment in the car by mother's expression, content, whole for a moment, holy. Your angels muscle through the now and then and what's to come, not caring where they plant their feet, not caring who they crush, so stainless and complete. They look down on us, stopping 50 years ago for gas, more cigars, and Eskimo pies, and on the man behind us in line. He needed cigarettes. His nails were clean, but his hands worse for wear, and he looked older then than a man his age now. Like every man in that filling station, he'd gone to war. Out back in a patch of weeds, we swung our feet at a picnic table, slapped mosquitoes, bit into ice cream and licked our wrists while the man behind us lit up, gunned his American engine and drove on. Motel postcards showed a bowl of sky tinged with green, a generous cocktail of leaded gas and low level radiation. To you, this is America's future, a star sapphire, a weird and worldly blue with a burst of light inside. But to me, it's an irretrievable past. The man in his car was the best of us. That's almost true. He populated this nation decent, hardworking, you'd say his streaming godhead inciting the night to infinite uproar. His godhead by day only nudging the surface. Head cocked, hat, shoulders back, he'd been a soldier, killing men brought no relief and he never spoke of it. America has always been defined by haunted men and women, but this one bore an extra burden our newfound power to kill everything. I remember a motel I always looked for, pitched on the bluff over a hydroelectric dam, centipedal warrens, each with closed drapes and orange doors. Transmission towers marched up the hills through the sagebrush and the dam was lit at night like a prison. Along with that neon sign, motel, it was the only consequential light in town. The drapes stayed closed. I'm trying to marry then and now. Dear Rilke, I enter one of those rooms, slide in beside the man and see him no better for our nakedness. How uneasily I love America. And every man, bystander, scapegoat, citizen, racist, chosen one, extra, blur at the edge of the frame, peripheral man. I studied him in the hardware store where he studied the penny nails. I studied him on the highway, his hands at 10 and two. I studied him on the news, blasted by a fire hose or standing back to watch it happen or bracing the hose as it blasted away. I studied him on the convention floor with fellow delegates or fellow strikers, aiding or aiming in a National Guard uniform, on a stool in a diner, drinking coffee alone from the low angle of a child. That man is gone now. If I call to him, he isn't here to answer. He is what's missing. Your angels don't distinguish time. They see us all dead and alive and yet to be tracing the river highway together. They see me with my old America behind pulled drapes. They hear him in my ear, despairing for the wreck of it we've made. Though even in the throes of nostalgia, I never quite believed in his goodness. It's a running argument in my head. Good at fixing broken flashlights and tumbling rocks in the garage. Good at keeping violent visions private. Good at separating needs from wants. He wraps me up and I'm safe in my bare brown hills. Look at me, he commands, but he's too close. I shut my eyes and say, I am. Then open them. We fall and rise and fall. 
strange, then familiar, then strange. Stupid, intolerant, and greedy, then a little better, then backward again, because we never learn. Angels gesture toward our screens, barkers barking in a sideshow. How money breeds, money's genitals, everything, the whole act. Barkers are running for president. America is nearly gone with the man who sold us ice cream and the man in line. I mistook the gold landscape for a golden age. Mother's eyes remain half hidden behind dark glass. It was the child in me that only saw the sunlit half. Rilke, you helped me see the present clearly. Dogs doing their business, sideshow carnies in the carnival crowd, and one pair of lovers in the grass. One pair of lovers to love for all of us. What is there to do but stare so hard I feel his lips on her lips, his palm on her blossoming breast, and wish myself between them. Thank you. Thanks all for listening. Thank you so much, Kathleen. That was beautiful. Um, I'm so looking forward to um, reading your book, Post Romantic. The, the poem about the Columbia River brought back some real scenes of scenes that I remember from living up the Metau Valley. So I'd like to introduce, it's such a privilege to introduce Claudia Castro Luna tonight and welcome her to our reading. She's the currently the Washington State Poet Laureate. She served as Seattle's civic poet from 2015 to 2017 and is the author of One River, A Thousand Voices by Chin Music Press, the Pushcart nominated Killing Marias by Two Sylvia's Press, a finalist for the Washington State 2018 Book Award in Poetry and This City, Floating Bridge Press. She is the creator of the acclaimed Seattle Poet Poetic Grid Castro Luna is the recipient of an Academy of Apar American Poets Laureate Fellowship. Born in El Salvador, she comes to, came to the United States in 1981. Claudia is currently working on a memoir about her experience escaping the Civil War in El Salvador. Living in English and Spanish, she writes and teaches in Seattle, where she gardens and keeps chickens with her husband and their three children. Welcome, Claudia. Thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation. It's just wonderful to be here with Kathleen. Kathleen, I have your book, and it was such a thrill to hear you read that last poem. Uh, there's nothing like hearing the author read their own work, and particularly that poem, um, which I love. Oh, and I have to say, Kathleen, that I just came out of teaching a class and I was referring to Rilke in that class as an influence um, on me for writing um, the poem that I will read tonight myself. So that is a really sweet poetic convergence. Um, and what I'll do is the One River, A Thousand Voices is one long poem uh, that is in the shape of a book. So it's a, it's a book that contains one long poem. Uh, and before that, I did want to read uh, two very short poems, another one about the Columbia River and one about a tree because I was just um, teaching a class on trees. And so I wanted to begin with that. Osmosis. I woke up refreshed from a nap on a grassy clearing, steps away from the great hemlocks downward, swooping boughs. With open eyes, I rested on my back for a while longer, watching clouds coast eastward toward snowy peaks I could not see, but know are there. From the nearby pond encircled by young alders, a frog insisted she had the better spot. When I finally sat up, I noticed that the patch of grass over which I slept had shielded me from a long root, a celluloid tentacle issuing from the hemlock. And I wondered whether the dreams I dreamt had been mine or if not by osmosis, 
the great trees. I love hemlocks. Um, one, of the, one of the things I have learned to love in my years living in Washington state. And this other poem is one that I wrote at the Mary Hill Museum where I traveled to watch the making of a most amazing art piece, which consisted, I think is uh, 13 hand carved panels, enormous panels that had been hand carved and were going to be printed using a steamroller and then assembled together. And actually the panels all together were um, done to scale to represent the Columbia River Gorge. So from the moment where the snake comes in, the Snake River, all the way down to the to the mouth of the river and different artists had and groups in some cases with collaborative panels were there. And I participated in the day just taking it all in. And then I wrote a poem um, that accompanied the actual work once it was all printed and hung in the museum. So this is called High Summer at Mary Hill Museum. And this is exactly the spot that Kathleen you just referred to when you were a child. Uh, you probably went over that bridge so, so many times you can't even count. So High Summer at Mary Hill Museum. Brink of rainbow, teeth of mountain, coyote stories, Nectar dreams of mining bees, yesterdays of yesterdays, and wherever there is already of today, entwined in the cobalt garland of the great river, seen today from Mary Hill Museum's verdant grounds, where print masters have gathered to share their third eye visions of what this river is, what it does, what it suffers, what it harbors yet in the churning of its waters. The artist's plan is to press, using a steamroller, 13 hand-carved panels and produce the longest block print ever. The river's plan is to be river, to mind itself, to flow regal onward to ocean's azure, while in nearby amber hills, crickets chirp among the fallen leaves of Gary Oaks from walking in uh, on, a, on a hill on an afternoon that I was there witnessing the river along the gorge on the Washington side and suddenly realizing what was that sound? What is all that jumping? And, you know, it was a whole bunch of crickets. Uh, it, was, it was amazing. I was there by myself and this dancing crickets in the afternoon and their, the sound of their uh, hopping resonating even more because they were landing on these dry leaves that had fallen from these oak trees. So um, I'll just, I'll, I'll read the entire re of the poem, One River, A Thousand Voices. It is, um, and then I'll share with you what it looks like when I'm done, because it is an unfolding accordion that I'm reading from. One River, A Thousand Voices. When world was clamshell and heaven and earth mirrored each other, the blue of one, hue to the other, when mountains spit fire and lava and their igneous entrails scorched earth and suffocated heavens. Back when time teetered on eternal night and light's brink augured the unbounded burgeoning imagination of life to come. Before Ponderosa and Hemlock sharpened their needles thus, and Cedar learned to lengthen its scales when Camas stained canyons endlessly cerulean blue, and over vast prairies flowers surrendered their yoke-stained petals to wind's pool. All the while, Time braided itself into your verdigree flow. Nature's godly audacity sowed mountains, crushed boulders, injected into each new grain of sand mineral traces from the Milky River up in heaven and into each salmon egg elemental mooring so that when grown, she would know to risk gill and gut on her return from ocean's depths to your sweet dreams for the chance to choose death to ensure future. 
Ever before the first human pupils bent in marvel and awe at the rumble and lightning grace and muscular rigging of your current, in this earlier time before humans came to call themselves in reference to you, river peoples and peoples of the river, fusing their being to your being, before the ancients taught first peoples what to call the things of the world and humans flourished along the length of you, and learn to honor and guard forevermore your presence and memory. A four sage woman etched into stone stories of her people and sat beside a quiet pool along rocky shores, hearing something of herself in the music and gargle of your waters. Before human tongues called a place of roaring, sizzling falls, Shunitwu, and your majestic self names of reverence, even before brave men perched on wooden planks and snared leaping salmons on their improbable journey to spawning sites, before prayers of praise and gratitude, before songs of sorrow and joy, before words spoken and unspoken rained upon your current, when cadence and rhythm of dancing feet transmitted heart and spleen, yearning and gratitude down to your silty floor, Certainly, thousands of years before captains jostled and repeatedly sailed past your ocean frontier, then sank along your bars before a man called you Columbia, you had long been Nichiwana, for millennia running unbounded Hoiling with coiled within your current arias of summer suns and howls of countless, countless wolf moons. Most certainly, before your chilly current was with concrete penned and silenced, so that your icy curves, icy pulse degenerated to tepid lakes, before plentiful salmon runs came to live their splendor only in the memory of those who were to them witness and their descendants, when man and woman were such, not Indian men and not Indian woman, a time before treaty and broken treaty had entered the lexicon of Salishan, Sahaptan, and Chinookan languages before men who had lived by their own rules were forced from their lands, before all the befores, you, river, had already been a thousand, had been called a thousand and one names, each name for every animal creature and vegetable spirit that ever breathed, mated and died, that ever flowered or shed a spore, each tree, each flower, each bulb, fish, mammal, insect, bird, each calling you a name of her own, from large to small, from scaly to winged, from furred to feathered, each thing indebted to your grace, scree, huckleberry, sage, pine, camas, alder, poplar, maple, lupin, deer, bear, coyote, elk, quail, grouse, hawk, eagle, bat, fox, wren, warbler, butterfly, burbot, salmon, lamprey, sturgeon, sculpin, all the flora, all the fauna calling you in dreams of awakening and in sobering dreams of change and demise, each name in every dimension perfect, iridescent as the miracle of a fish scale, fragile as dragonfly's wings, as truly reed, sturdy and resilient as bitter root, each diurnal and nocturnal creature, her features embodying her own melodious name for life, the owl who swoops to snatch in night's downy hush, the unsuspecting frog, trout whose rainbow swagger flares gainfully your waters as we call out to them, they call out to you, woodpecker tribes, beaver bands, cornflower clumps, each living thing with their own ardent name on the hoof, on the scale, on the feather, on the fur, on the leaf, on the mud, on the beak, on the bark, one river, a thousand names, a thousand voices chanting river songs, singing songs of place, charting songs, songs of belonging, sage women and wise men sends these non-human nomenclatures at the margins of their knowing, but never possess them. 
for those names belong only to you, river, to your meandering ways, to the islands in your midst, to the channels of your delta, to the splendor of your gorge, to the rage of your falls, to the turbulence of your current, to the eternal, unpredictable, and to silence to the language of time. O oh, river, impervious to human foibles, kinks and skill, to wolves' backbone and cunning, to salamander's tremulous heart, to the rustling of poplar tree leaves. River, you against whom people and creatures harness survival and hope, what names do you call us when wings at sunset fold and later when we surrender to night? our eyes. For it is hubris to grant faith and dominion only to alphabet and sword. It is hubris not to consider that you who for millennia have run and pumped don't also have manner and fashion of your own. Just because your course was marked on a map as territory and a four syllable named on you in post does not make your riverness conquerable. For all we know and think we know, human experience is pinhead to the universe of your waters as mist from mountain rises at dawn and to dusk belong the spirits who tease lush lavender skies yours is the thingness and riverness of you oh great river oh giver of life oh keeper of time then then as you shall again flow supreme singular to your mission that being your effulgent returned first to ocean the great water then to cloud diaphanous water, then to rain and snow shaped water to return back down mountains, channeling rills over mossy hills, fitting, fitting rivulets quietly resting for a moment in the swirl of a chilly eddy, hustling onto streams, eventually to your own mighty torque and rhythm whose thunderous physics bolt you forward through canyons around bends past floodplains, shaping plateaus and prairies to estuary and delta, finally to empty yourself, unrelenting for the future. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming and listening. Oh, Claudia, thank you so much for that beautiful reading. Thank you to both of you. Let's have a round of applause for them both. And I hope you can hear us through Zoom, <laughs> all this clapping. Oh boy, Claudia, you just, both of you just made my night. I have, this is one of my treasured books. This is the, the ah, book yes. that Claudia just read from. And it's, it's just exquisite. And such a pleasure to hear you read it, Claudia. I've you know, read it myself, but I haven't heard it in your voice. So, oh, so many lines. I was scribbling them down madly and people were scribbling them down in the chat too. So what names do you call us? Oh, that river and that litany of all of the river's inhabitants. Just beautiful. I think we're all a little speechless in terms of questions. <laughs> I'm seeing praise just, you know, surging in like a river. Um, and so I think I'm going to start with a question that I have yeah. for, for you. Maybe you can start, Claudia, and then Kathleen. Sure. Just in terms of your role as Poet Laureate, um, you know, and you guys you both, I think, made such a commitment to getting poetry out into the every corner of the state. And I just wonder if you could just um, talk about what was what you found most satisfying or if there was if there are any moments that stand out in terms of kind of bringing poetry to a broader audience oh there's so there's so many uh, I, I keep on thinking of kathleen we had uh the olympia poetry network invited all poets laureate uh, last 
year, or maybe not, it wasn't last year, it was the year before, of course. And Kathleen said that she never got sick once during her time as Poet Laureate because she enjoyed the work so much. And that just stayed with me, the, the, the joy and the commitment to it, you know, but also just imbued in this faith for the word that just carries you. So I, I, I don't know that I could single out a, a, an individual time because there, there's so many, and I think part of part of um, part of it is getting acquainted with the land. For me, because uh, uh, Kathleen, you you are from Washington State, and you grew up along the river. Um, part of this project for me was the the project that birthed this book was that I I think the flow of the the Columbia bisects the state exactly in half. You could trace the state. Um, I mean, it's just like a, a, an etching in the middle. And yet we know so little about what happens in that part of the state. I mean, I think that we know a lot what happens on this side of the mountains and certainly um, Spokane and Pullman, Walla Walla. There's a lot, there's a, a lot that happens there, certainly in poetry and there's a lot of activity, but what about the middle, you know? Uh, so I think for me, uh, spending all that time traveling alone through all those roads along that river and in and through forests and mountains it is um it just the landscape i always ask myself how do you love landscape how do you come to love a landscape say for somebody like myself who is who is not from here but i have a deep affinity and love for, for this place for puget sound and certainly as a result of my my chance to serve as laureate the eastern side of the state and um yeah i i i ask that question all the time how do you come how do you arrive at loving a place that is not the place that you have embedded from birth, your original place, Kathleen's stories of having those trips across the river, that eastern part being so much a part of you. Well, Washington has become that to me as an adult, as serving in this position, right? The poet laureateship has granted, has given me that enormous gift uh, of just being and truly being, being present, being committed to, to sharing poetry with with communities in Washington State has, oh, that was the intent. That was the, that was the intent, but the result of it, what has given back to me among many things is an appreciation and a love for the landscape and the, and the natural history of this place, which, you know, I will have forever. Yeah, so, I, I think my answer would be very similar, although, I would say that Claudia, her, her task was <laughs> like twice as big a mountain as I ever had to climb. I mean, I, I was I was poet laureate from 2012 to 2014 after a three year hiatus. So part of my job was sort of getting it rolling again. So I would say the first few months, you know, I was definitely busy, but I was much busier at the end than I was at the beginning. And then Elizabeth and then Todd and then Claudia. And it's just been a ball rolling down a hill and it's so much larger than it ever was. And I don't know how Claudia has done what she's done. It's just amazing. Um, but what I remember so clearly, I love the people. I loved having a place to go. I love these trips where I had a, I had a job to do and there were people waiting for me and it made me feel so, um, purposeful and it was also the first time in my life i'd had this this um this task to go out on my own and do it and so i would echo what claudia says i think some of my very dearest memories are of, of the road trip aspect of it like getting in the car in the morning from my home i remember one trip especially across highway two i i went up um over the um, Stevens Pass into Wenatchee and then up onto the plateau and then took highway two all the way across the state into Idaho and then back down into Pullman that all happened in one day and I it was an incredible incredible beautiful September day that I will never forget as long as I live and that I think some of those trips um, just just like 
a movie playing on my windshield that I think that was the, the most glorious aspect, not more glorious than poetry, but certainly it was, it was huge. It was a huge thing for me. Oh, thank you, both of you. Yeah, boy, it's so wonderful to hear you talk about your love of landscape, Claudia. That is, that is close to my heart as well, as you know, and, and such an interesting question. And um, yeah, and the way in which all the poet laureates keep building on each other, as, as Kathleen mentioned. Yeah, I guess, you know, it's, I always find it instructive to hear what, um, what else, you know, what people are working on, Claudia, and I, I know that you're working on some essays. I wonder, on a memoir specifically, could you maybe talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think, the, well, the essays are essentially, I would say they fall under that title of how do you come to love a place, you know, and they're an exploration of of Washington State and the and the way in which the human human ecology converges uh, with la with with the ecology of the place, how those two things come together um, in in this in this state. And I don't think I would have anything to say had I not been out there on those roads for all the, for those two years. Um, but yeah, more an exploration of is how is it that we arrive at a place and come to be? Uh, I think that's what's driving those essays. They're a little bit maybe like travel essays in a way, but also um, an examination of, of, you know, how do you arrive? How do you land in a place? How do you come about to call yourself from a place, right? And I think people do this all the time. We do this all the time. Um, and so that's on the, on the essays, on the side of the essays. And, um, with the with the memoir is a project that's been in the works for a long time. I finally have a full draft of it, uh, and it's essentially my leaving El Salvador when I was 14 years old, and my parents and my sister and I fled the war, the Civil War. Understanding much later in my in my as an adult that I had suffered a very traumatic thing living through those years of the war and sort of an exploration of how that passed as 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 much as we tried to to overcome it never left it's it's part and by us i mean my family right i mean salvadoran uh, immigrants here it's part of us and and we have to acknowledge and and look at that history to understand how is it that we come to be here so oh oh thank you claudia boy i look forward to both of them. And I guess that brings me to my next question really for both of you, because I know when you're poet laureate and you're traveling so much, you know, how do you keep your own writing practice going in the midst of, you know, everything else? Were you able to write at the time or did you take a lot of notes and come back and work with those notes? How, how did that work? Maybe you could start with that one, Kathleen. Oh, well, I occasionally had poems, you know, um, requests for poems, you know, that that happened a few times. So I would dutifully write those. Um, I wouldn't say they're all winners, but, I, you know, I actually a couple of poems made it into my book. Um, so that is something. But generally, I would say I just didn't write very much. And I would say afterwards, I wrote even less. Um, it, it had, it was a very... I loved every minute of it. It was a wonderful experience, but it, it does transition you into a kind of public poet for a while. Mm -hmm. And it's the I, I found that the that the pulling back into the private poet was a really un, uncomfortable and confusing time for me. And um, yeah, I I've really struggled with writing since then, frankly. But um, but I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not thinking that at that, you know, I think that might change at any point. I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think balancing those voices. Go ahead, Claudia, please. I, I was, I was going to, because I had a question for Kathleen about your beautiful book, Kathleen, because I remember you saying in at the Olympia gathering that exactly what you just said, that it was a transition 
uh, coming out of that really kind of demanding schedule and public self to a private writer self. And uh, so I just wanted to, you know, and, and yet you have a beautiful uh, new book, right? So how was that process of bringing those poems into, into being? Well, some of the poems are very old. I mean, some of those poems go back to probably 2005. Um, and so it was a slow, and you know, it took me a long time to write it. Um, so it's just time, I guess, more than anything. Um, and uh, I think, I do think that once your book starts to have a form, you know, you, you start to collect them and they kind of, you start to see spaces and relationships. I think that also encouraged me to write some new poems to fill in some of those spaces. Mm -hmm. But I would say it was a slow process, but I am a slow writer. So that's really not a new thing. Mm -hmm. How about you? How did you manage? I don't know how you have time to tie your shoes, let alone anything else. <laughs> We're writing. I thought this last year was this last year was was good because it forced us. I mean, on the writing end, right? I mean, there's nothing good about it, but uh, being suddenly moving at such high speed, traveling around and having you know lots of events, especially with the river project, um, suddenly come to a halt was really was difficult. It was it was a I couldn't let go. I couldn't let go of all the planning that was workshops and traveling to places. And, you know, we had worked with libraries and schools and that all was gone. It was really hard. It was hard for me to not have that. It felt such a, I lived with this sense of incompleteness mm -hmm. because as much as I have tried to, to recuperate through Zoom, it's never the same. And that the aspect of the land and being in communion with the place itself is lost. So that was, yeah, I, I mean, I'm with you that there wasn't much time for writing. You know, I, I have gone back. The memoir has been in the works for a long, long time. Um, I did manage, I do have, I put together a new manuscript of poems uh, that I've been writing off and on. And and this the second half of last year allowed me time to write. So that was good, finding little pockets. Um, but it wouldn't have happened if I was, if if things were normal, because I would have been on the road and, and gladly so, I would have been on the road, you know. Um, yeah, the, the pandemic was, I think, difficult for all of us in that sense. But for public program is right when you feel that you could, poetry could do something. We could come together. We could process this. Uh, it was it was gone. So, yeah. Um, I do think for the next poet laureate, the silver lining is to know that we are all now young, everybody, um, are used to doing what we're doing right now. And so it facilitates for the new laureate to be in places without, you know, exhaustive traveling. That trip you described sounds crazy that you put all those miles in one day. <laughs> that sounds just... It wasn't ordinary, but it was, it was special though. Yes, yes. So, um, so I think that there is a little silver lining that we have learned to use Zoom, that we could be, the next laureate will be able to be in classes and in places uh, without having to, you know, put all those miles um, and, and also travel, but a combination of both, so. So uh, there was a question that was just posted on the chat um, asking of the poets, when you write um, some of these long poems, do you do them in one continuous long sitting over a period of days or are there writing gaps while you gather your material and thoughts and muse? Well, uh, this this new book of mine has several long poems, which is unusual for me. But I think all of them share one quality, which is they're written in sections. And there's something about sections that for me made it possible to do. I um, I thought of them like, you know, you're crossing a stream and you, you go sort of hop from rock to rock to rock. Mm -hmm. And um, so they that allowed me to get across in little jumps. Um, and I think, actually, having said that, though, they stew upstairs for a very long time. And then usually the actual writing, it is maybe at least sketching out, writing as much as I can, 
at once to get the draft down and then um, and then starting to just chip away at it in terms mm -hmm. of editing. But I, I do think most of it is up here and then trying to get it out in one fell swoop. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Well, I, I ended up my writing this long poem. I've never written anything so long. Um, and I think there were two things parallel happening. One was a design project, which from the beginning I wanted to, to have an accordion book, which meant long. So I knew that the design was driving the writing to some extent, but I, I spent um, months writing that poem. It was, it was really months of traveling back to the river, back to the river and um, also reading. So doing uh, an extraordinary amount of historical reading um, and just trying to fill myself with all aspects of the of the river and experiencing it myself. Um, I mean, the arrival of that of the title, you know, happened. I was in I was near Spokane, mm -hmm. and suddenly that idea that that the river is such a force of life and that not, not that feeds us humans and it has done so much for the state. Uh, right, with all the ways in which the Apple industry maps itself perfectly over the mm -hmm. terrain that the river covers, but just the production of energy and all of this. Um, and I thought the river is a giver of life, but it gives life to other things besides us. And it was, it was like you said, Kathleen, it was a constant thinking about it, that that idea then... Um, arrived finally i think after considering it in in other ways that wasn't so the awareness the full awareness that the words hadn't been attached mm -hmm. to that understanding and then suddenly there they were very clearly um and once i had the title for once i don't work that way normally but this thing this idea that other living things also have names that we can never know we cannot possibly know um then the whole thing then began to take a very quick pace after that. But it was really months of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, and like, may I say something, Holly? So uh, somebody's asking a question about the accordion book. So the, uh, the book was published as a, as a, um, as a letterpress project, and I was able to do that through, and Holly has it, yeah, and it's really amazing because it's all hand printed. I did it myself with the help of Jenny Wilkson, and it just was an amazing thing to do, but I was able to raise funds to produce this short version that then um, to go to all libraries across the state. Uh, so to, to, discuss the river to bring the river into you know our conversations but also to to think about the book as an object of of art that the book itself is doing something so that so those books went out uh to the libraries and then when a chin music press published it uh the funds from the book part of the funds are going to a nonprofit on the river, uh, Columbia River Keepers. And they're an amazing nonprofit that does terrific work all along the river, not only in the gorge, they're based on the, um, well, they, they really do work along the gorge, uh, based in Oregon. And um, the funds are going to them for all the good work that they do. So it's, it's I like the idea that, that the river of, the goodwill that came from making that that letterpress project possible continues to reproduce and actually go back into the river in you know projects that take care of its waters and environmental protections and things like that. Yeah. Oh, that's that's great, Claudia. You know, we have one more question. I think we have time for it, and this is um, this is coming from Shika, who is actually coming to us from Hong Kong. And she is asking, both of you have impressive bookshelves behind you. What are you currently reading, if you don't mind me asking? I'm reading, seriously, I'm reading Kathleen's book. 
<laughs> I was so happy that you read that opening poem because I read it and I love the format and I love the way it's long and in pieces. And I saw uh, there are several poems like that. And the poem that you opened with, with your son, I, I have read that before. So it was wonderful to hear you uh, read that. Um, and what else am I reading? I'm looking through, uh, I'm reading through a collected works of Denise Levertov, whom I love. And it's, you know, a, a giant book. I don't have it near here, but um, yeah. Those are two current reads. Great. Okay, well, I, I mentioned up front that I'm reading Lucille Clifton and yes. um, she is very, very excellent company. Okay. Yes. Um, I. <laughs> I am, I'm in the middle of Natasha Trethewey's memoir, which is absolutely beautiful, and it reads like a poem. Um, I am, I also, I usually am listening to novels. So right now, I'm, I just today finished a novel, the, the novel by Ayed Akhtar called Homeland Elegies, which is incredible. It's just such a beautiful book. And before that, I finished... Uh, Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell, which is another beautiful novel, uh, just gorgeous language. Um, and what other po I've been reading other poems, but there's something about that question that makes everything fall out of my head. I can never remember what it is. Always, always. <laughs> <laughs> remember, what was the last thing I read? <laughs> anyway, um, it's actually, it's a great time. There's some really good poetry coming out right now. I, I just can't tell you what it is. <laughs> I've, I've been reading uh, more maybe non-poetry related um, stuff. I've read um, a book called Barrio America, um, which is about the, the way in which American cities at one point were, um, you know, spiraled downward and, and there was a, an, an exodus from American cities and Latino immigrants came into those spaces and in a way revitalized mm -hmm. those areas like the mission in San Francisco to and, and made them this vibrant walkable uh, districts, Chicago as well, in Austin that happened. Um, Sandoval Strauss is the name of the of of the of the writer. And and just just watching, I know I lived, I visited the mission in San Francisco so often, and it's now being gentrified. And he argues that this immigrant uh, immigrants uh, revitalized um, these areas and made them really appealing mm -hmm. to then folks who wanted to young folks, uh, um, you know, cutting edge kind of urbanites who wanted to return and to to the city because of what they offered. And in fact, then, you know, displacing these people who, who actually revitalized this area. So it was a very interesting argument for the urbanization of, of American, the core of American cities. That was it's an interesting read. Great. Great. Well, you're leaving us with many riches, not only this reading, but a whole reading list <laughs> to look forward to. Thank you so much. And I think we probably need to wrap up. I just wanted to um, invite everybody to put their cameras back on so we can all see each other before we all disappear into the night. And um, Linda's gonna make a few closing comments, but I just wanted to say for myself, I, this was such a wonderful, Claudia used the phrase early on, the poetic convergence. And I felt like it happened all evening. <laughs> both of your work converging in so many wonderful, you know, somewhat expected, but also some really unexpected ways too. So thank you. And just a, a quick pitch for their books. I've posted um, in the chat the information about both their books if you want to support your local poets and your local bookstores. Open Books is always a good place to go. Um, and Linda will wrap up with a little bit about what's coming in the future with the Northwind Reading Series. Yes, so thanks again, Kathleen and um, Claudia. It's just a wonderful night. It just, I'm so thankful that it's recorded and so we can share this with people that weren't able to come tonight and if we, and we can rewatch it and, and enjoy the words again. Thank you so much. 
Um, thanks also to George and Centrum for partnering with the Northwind Reading Series and to, to everyone who came and attended. Um, we did post the, Holly posted a lot of the links for, for the books in, on the chat. Um, and we'll be posting this recorded reading on the Northwind Reading Series Facebook page and on northwindart.org website and their Facebook page and Centrum's website as well. So coming up, the next reading for the Northwind series that we'll, um, we're gonna have as a live Zoom as well will be next March 25th, a Thursday night. It's from seven to eight again, and it will be presenting um, the Floating Bridge chapbook winners, Brenda Miller and Risa Denenberg. And that will be um, March 25th at seven to eight. And so we hope you'll join us again for that reading. And um, if you'd like to be added to our mailing list, you can uh, look at the northwindart.org website or email us at nwindreaders at gmail.com. And we'll put you on our mailing list and you'll get the MailChimp that goes out once a month that will tell you who's coming. We've got a, a full year of readings ahead of us and we're really happy to have you join us. So thanks again, Kathleen and Claudia. It was just such a wonderful night. Thank you.